Hi, and welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. I am your host, Steve Bissam. I'm an author and mental health counselor. Are you curious about therapy? Do you feel there is a lot of mystery about therapy? Do you wonder what your therapist is doing and why? The goal of this podcast is to make therapy and psychology accessible to all by using real language and straight-to-the-point discussions. This podcast wants to remind you to take care of your mental health, just like you would your physical health. Therapy should not be intimidating. It should be a great way to better help. I will demystify what happens in counseling, discuss topics related to mental health, and discussions you can have with your therapist. I also want to introduce psychology in everyday life, as I feel most of our lives are enmeshed in psychology. I want to introduce the subtle and not-so-subtle ways psychology plays a factor in our lives. It will be my own mix of thoughts as well as special guests. So join me on this discovery of therapy and psychology. Hi, and welcome to episode 45 of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. I am Steve Bissell. If you haven't listened to episode 44, yes, I urge you to do so. We talk about toxic positivity, and I hope that you really get something out of that because I think that this is a problem that happens a whole lot. So I hope you get a chance to look at that. But in episode 45, we are going to talk to Morgan Beard. Morgan is releasing her pop EP debut, Elemental, which we'll talk, we'll talk about, I'm sure, in the interview. And Morgan is also a coach and has dedicated her life to using creative energy to heal and empower. She has managed her depression and anxiety since age 13, and we'll probably talk about her experience in therapy, which I'm looking very much forward to. With her coaching career going really well. She also created a lot of good energy for herself and was able to get the confidence to embrace her earliest passion for singing and making music to help people move. So I hope we get to talk about that. But here is the interview. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 45. I'm very excited to talk to the next guest because I've followed her on Instagram. I got connected with uh, an organization we both know. And ever since I've been like, kind of like very interested in her whole story because her her story is amazing and can't wait to talk about her music too. So there's a lot of great stuff to talk about. Morgan Beard, welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. You know, I always start with the same question with everyone. It's because I, this is also kind of a funny one because I'm going to be like, I'm also learning about you. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I am currently a creative life coach living in Los Angeles. And what that means and sort of how I got there is that I was living in New York several years ago and I got my master's in art therapy because I decided I wanted to find a way to combine my desire to help people with my desire to be creative and use the artistic process. And I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm going to be an art therapist for the rest of my life. I found my purpose. I found my calling. Fast forward five months later into working my first job after grad school at a big nursing home. I was completely burnt out. I was at rock bottom of my own personal depression, which I had visited with many times since I first started experiencing it as a young teenager at age 13. And I was just looking around at my life in New York and going, oh my God, none of this works for me anymore. What am I going to do? Feeling completely hopeless, completely lost. And so I ended up moving to Los Angeles mostly because I thought, you know what? Sunshine might make me happy. It's that simple. And really leaving kind of the New York grind culture and trying to carve out a way for myself to put less weight on what my career and my purpose had to be and more weight on what actually makes me happy on the simplest level. So I moved to Los Angeles and I ended up getting a job as an assistant to this woman who was a business coach for creative female entrepreneurs. And I had no plan whatsoever to continue working anywhere near the field of helping others in this discipline. But after working for her for about three months and kind of learning the ins and outs of her business, I was like, you know what? I do want to do this again. I know how I can help people and I can use a lot more of myself in my work than I did when I was a therapist. Because a lot of what I do as a coach is informed by my own personal struggle and the things that I use that have gotten me through various hurdles through my life, you know, overcoming depression and anxiety and just kind of 
redesigning my life around trying to find happiness and then incorporating some of the ideas and the tools of art therapy, which is self-expression and just the the power of self-expression for self-discovery, for just getting stuff out of you <laughs> right. is just such a powerful force. Yeah. And through that process, realizing like, oh, I'm coaching other people to go for the things that they're the most passionate about and overcome their fears. And that's when music kind of started to rear its head again. That was my original passion as a very small child. I loved to sing. I loved to dance and perform, but it was not accepted. So I kind of pushed it down. And then being a coach for others, it kind of bubbled back up in my own healing process. And now I am making pop music to also try to help people heal and transform. <laughs> well, I already listened to a little bit of what you had on your Instagram, great music so far, and I can't wait for it a single. I, we're recording this on a Wednesday. It's being released on Friday. I know this podcast is only coming out about six weeks after that, but I will be sharing that because I'm very excited for you. Amazing. And yeah, by the time it comes out, the next song off of the EP will be out and we'll be in the thick of it. So it'll be awesome. Anything I can do to support you, that's awesome. I love people who are self-expressing and finding their ways because one of the things that struck me in what you just said is that you said you love music and you love dancing, but it was not accepted. Yeah. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Because I'm very curious sure. now. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> so when I was very little, I was an only child and I had parents who were, well, I'll speak specifically of my mom. My mom was very hovering and intense and she filmed a lot of my early life. And so when I was, you know, under four years old, she, she always had the big VHS camera on her shoulder and was filming me and, and say this, say that, do this, sing this song, do this dance, do this thing. And, and really like, making me perform. And then once I kind of got to five or six, I started to really enjoy it of my own accord and want to sing and want to dance and really loved doing that. And then somehow, some reason, I, you know, I still am kind of piecing it together. She decided, nope, it's not cute anymore. That went back to the sort of children should be seen and not heard philosophy, both of my parents. And it just kind of became something that was rejected or mocked or ignored. And it gave me this sort of underlying belief about myself that I shouldn't want to shine. I shouldn't want to be a performer. I shouldn't want to express myself in this way. It was bad. It was wrong. I would lose love if I showed myself in that way. So it took a really, really long time for me to, I mean, you know, I only started making music at 29. So it took decades to, to unearth those really formative wounds. And I'm, you know, I'm still in the release phase right now. It's still a major thing that, that I'm overcoming this process of getting visible around what I do and promoting it. It's challenging. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because I hear only child and as an only child myself, oh. I relate to you a whole lot. The hovering parent or mom, uh, I certainly relate to that. And, yeah. I, you know, I'm smiling right now and no one can see it. It's a podcast. But uh, <laughs> I, also, I also felt intense sadness about not being able to be yourself. And it's, yes. it's I, when I heard that, I, I, you, you said it with a, such a nice smile. You've been through a lot of therapy, I can tell. Yes, uh, <laughs> Oh, yes. I love therapy so much. <laughs> yeah, well, you said that, and I saw it in your bio too, but you talked about yeah. at age 13, depression really hitting. Can you yeah. can you tell me more? Because that it, it is difficult. Oh, yeah. Like it, I could talk about being an only child for hours because people always think that we have it so easy. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, we don't have to share so much, which is great. But we also have a pressure that people who have two or three children cannot possibly phantom. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a huge part of the only child experience and the depression for me is just loneliness. I mean, my childhood felt extremely lonely. I was, I, it's not like I lived in, you know, a totally remote area where there was no one else. You know, we Where'd sometimes had neighbors, Wilmington, Delaware, okay. kind of suburbish area. Yeah. But also my parents were significantly older. So there was also like a major generation gap between myself and them. And they were the people that I interacted with the most. So I, when they were, when they didn't want to interact with me, it was like, you know, 
go to your room, do your own thing. And that was like most of my childhood. And I, I, I didn't even realize that that was abnormal until later, you know, going to college and being like, wow, I'm just overwhelmed by the fact that there are other people around all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to just being in a cave and making my own fun for hours. <laughs> you learn to entertain yourself, but it's also kind of like a double-edged sword too. Totally. And you don't, one of the most challenging things for me too, and challenging is sort of a whitewashed word, but not, not having siblings to validate my perspective about my parents. Like the only, when I would try to get connection or empathy with like my dad over something that my mom did, it was like, no, 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 she's perfect, blah, blah, blah. And so my assertion that, wait, no, this is really wrong. This is really hurting me. This is really unacceptable was completely denied. And so that led also to this process of really struggling to feel that my feelings were accurate, let alone even bad. So that that also took years of unwinding in therapy. And I, I, I know a lot of people experience that, only child or not, but that that, that sort of chronic invalidation is extremely harmful and it can go unnoticed for long periods of time. Yeah. And it definitely, you know, the feeling inaccurate is very difficult because I find that with only children too, there is, you know, I think you see it in across children, but particularly with for, with only children or first children, perfectionism and having to be perfect, you know, like that little, uh, you know, the white picket fence, the two cars, the a little house and all that. There's a lot of pressure put on only children. So I get it. Yes. I, I certainly get it. And when did you first kind of like realize that you can have feelings that may not match your parents? Was it through therapy? Was it through friends? I think therapy was a really big part of it. I went through a little bit of therapy as a high school senior, but that I even had to fight for because, you know, my parents didn't want me to be in therapy. They they thought it was ridiculous and, you know, pulled me out of it pretty quickly. And that was traumatic, obviously. And then I went back into therapy at the end of college. And I would say college was kind of the first time I really got to have my own independent lens on like what was going on in my life because I had enough space between myself and my parents to be able to look around and, yeah, starting to see other other peers and what they were doing and starting to have those questions and then bringing them to a professional that could validate what I was saying. I mean, that was tremendously empowering for me. And then continuing that process through when I was living in New York after college with other therapists and just continuing to get more and more clarity on those distortions. It, it really took a period of years as an adult to figure out. I, I joke around. Have you figured it out yet? Because <laughs> I'd like to switch spots with you right now. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> Some days yes, other days eh, eh. You know, it's you're always you're always evolving and it totally depends on like your emotional state and what else is going on in your life, like how firmly you feel like you have a grasp on these things. You're never done. <laughs> and I I feel like the grasp is gone for a long time, <laughs> but that's just me. <sighs> Yeah. We'll talk about therapy and you, you, you mentioned something that I still feel happens a lot with families, happens a lot with different people. There's a stigma around therapy. You know, I grew like I was thinking in my head when you were thinking, we were talking like, did you grow up in Quebec? Because I know you said Delaware, but I mean, my family and my, how I grew up in Quebec is you don't go to therapy because that's right. for the week. Yep. So did you feel that for yourself? And how do we work as people who are, for lack of a better word, enlightened? I don't think we're that special, but we are enlightened to kind of encourage people to go out and get some support through mental health. Yeah, I absolutely lived through an environment where it was seen as you're weak, it's unnecessary, it's ridiculous, you're being dramatic, every single possible insult. But what I started to recognize as I had gone through more therapy and got older and wiser was, oh, the reason this was so criticized and shot down for me was because, you know, my parents' egos are at stake in what I'm doing. Right. And it's much more about them not being willing to own those parts of them, the parts of them that are depressed, the parts of them that are mentally ill, the parts of them that are unhappy or unfulfilled or whatever. And therapy can be a way of addressing any number of things. It's really just having a 
relationship with someone who can hold space for whatever's going on with you. Right. You don't have to be psychotic. And actually therapy is, you know, it's, it's more effective for people that are non psychotic neurotic and not psychotic <laughs> actually. <laughs> so I'm a firm believer that everyone can benefit from a therapeutic relationship. I mean, everyone can benefit from that friend who listens and a therapist is like a friend who listens, but is trained to do so in a way that can move you along a spectrum and point things out if they're good, you know? Right. I do hear a lot of complaints from people that, you know, my therapist just listens and doesn't contribute anything. And in that, what I would say to that is like, go find another therapist because everyone works differently. So it's really about finding that right relationship where you feel like you can unfold. I agree. You said so many great things in what you just said. The first thing is, you know, like I'll share my story. I, people know yeah. from the podcast, but I was 12 years old and my best friend died in a fire mm -hmm. and we played football. We played soccer together. And my parents who, you know, I heard on the radio and my parents turned to me when we heard his name. Well, you know, you better be ready for the game on Saturday. And that was my <gasps> grief process. And oh, I want to make no. sure that anybody who's listening to this, I, I, I can't speak for Morgan. I'll speak for myself. We're not blaming our parents here. This is not about blaming whoever. It's how the sometimes how we grow up and that's what they know. So, you know, I don't blame my parents. I can't speak for you, Morgan. But for me, that was my experience that probably why I do therapy today and turning to coaching and stuff like that, because I, I think it's important to kind of have that space. So I, I really feel your story a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's so, oh my God, that's so tragic. I'm so sorry that that was your experience. It, you know, if, if anything, it taught me the importance of therapy, taught me the importance of being open about stuff. And my, I wrote a book last year and my podcast has been out for about a year now. Even my closest friends are like, you never told me that. And I'm wow. like, I'm oh, sorry. I, I grew up in Quebec and they're all my Quebec friends. I'm like, we're not supposed to talk about that, I thought. So <laughs> yeah. you, really, you really need to kind of like get to the right therapist. And I think you said it right. The other thing I want to mention, my, my business is straight to the point therapy and coaching. So for me, most of my clients are like, wow, you don't pull any punches. I'm like, well, if you want someone who pulls punches, that's fine. I'll find you someone. But I don't pull punches. And it's, you're absolutely right on, find the right therapist. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. How do we encourage people to get the right therapist? Because I think that what people do, is sometimes they kind of say, oh, well, this is what therapy is. I can mm -hmm. name you 400 different things about therapy that are different from one person to the next. Yep. I, the best analogy that I like to share is it's like tasting a kiwi and going, I don't like fruit. <laughs> and it's like, okay, but have you tried a banana? Have you tried an apple? Have you tried watermelon? They're wildly different. <laughs> I like that analogy. But yeah, like, it, I mean, same, same as like romantic partnership. It's like, you right. know, you could judge all of your, of what is romance on your first boyfriend or girlfriend or whoever. Like, no, no, um, <laughs> that's just the beginning of, of finding your way and finding who you are and what you like and what you don't like. And I think that what I also remind people is that there's no one like, you know, people talk about CBT and DBT and behavioral and Roger and, and all that stuff. And people ask me all the time, which one is the most effective? And I say the therapeutic alliance. Mm, yes. Oh, my God. Yes. Amen. If I don't like and this is you know, if I'm burning, a, I'm breaking a wall here. If you don't like your client, it's hard for a therapist to be effective. And it's, if you don't like your therapist, it doesn't work well for the client. And if I'm breaking a wall here, I'm fine with it because <laughs> I think it, it's really hard to be able to do that because, you know, sometimes it's language, you know, for me, we talked uh, prior to the interview, I swear, I don't have a problem with swearing, but for some clients that's not acceptable, which is fine. That means they may need someone who doesn't do that and that's fine. But I, I really like what you said about that. And thing that came to mind is when you talk about the depression, and I certainly struggle with my mm -hmm. depression and my post-traumatic stress disorder. How do you regulate those negative thoughts and how does it relate to behavioral patterns? I'd like to hear more about that because you seem to be know a whole lot about this. Yes. Uh, so similarly, a lot of personal experience here that informs my work. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's always sort of that blessing and that curse. So sort of similar to your answer about the therapeutic alliance. Like, how do you deal with negative thoughts? 
you don't like you it's the way you meet yourself it's the way that you meet yourself it's your alliance with yourself because you can have a negative thought like i'm a piece of shit and if your response is ah you're a piece of shit for telling yourself you're a piece of shit or sort of in that energy of like ah you shouldn't think that you rah, 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 that same critical voice and tone you're not you're just kind of bringing a gun to a gunfight instead of like right. disarming that gun. This is a, sort of a weak metaphor, but whatever. <laughs> it, we'll, we'll make a few of those and we'll make some good ones. It works out. <laughs> yeah. We'll hit the full gamut. So what you really have to do is try to come into that situation with yourself, with the mindfulness that that negative thought, that negative behavior, whatever that feeling is, it comes from somewhere and usually it comes from hurt, whether it's hurt that you've inflicted on yourself, hurt that someone else has inflicted on you that got sort of lodged in your brain as a coping mechanism. And the, the more keen your observational skill and mindfulness skill is, the more you can hold that part of yourself that has the negative thought and witness that with kindness and also come into that conversation with a different voice with a different energy. And that's how you kind of bring the negative to where you are instead of trying to beat it down with more negativity. It's really more about the how you approach it than like whatever technique you have. Because again, you can apply all these techniques, CBT, DBT, all these things. But if you're not changing the voice and the how and the making that holding space that you give yourself kinder, you're not really going to move anything around. Yeah. And I, you know, just a reminder to everyone, we're listening to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. I'm Steve Visa. We're listening to Morgan Beard talk about her and we're going to talk about her, a lot of different things about her, but really look, enjoying this conversation because I think that you're right. That circular motion of I'm a piece of shit. Oh, stop calling yourself a piece of shit. You piece of shit. Okay. Piece right. of shit. <laughs> and that, that just never stops. And you know, all you do is you rotate them through the same thought pattern. I also remind people, and I don't know if you agree with me, because I, I think that when you have negative thoughts, I tell people, don't hang out with people with negative thoughts. I work with mm -hmm. a lot of first responders and correctional staff, and I'm like, yeah, maybe you don't hang out with people who think that way because you're just going to feed the machine, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. There, like since <laughs> since moving to Los Angeles, I've become much more of like a woo-woo spiritual person, <laughs> which can turn people off. But on the other hand, I'm like, all right, well that's fine. I'm happier for it. And it helps me understand my world in a way that connects to my intuitive sense of it. But like, it's a vibrational thing, a frequency thing of like, it just feels like garbage. It just feels like eating crap. And if you, yeah, if you hang out with people that eat crap, you're more likely to eat crap. You're just going to be in that vicinity kind of right. soaking up that toxic concoction all the time. And it certainly leads to those behavioral patterns you talked about earlier. And uh, don't worry about the woo-woo stuff. I, I am a woo-woo person myself. And I know people say that woo-woo is a negative connotation. I really don't mm -hmm. care. I'm okay with it. Uh, I don't know if you're okay with it, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> great, great. You know, talking about a little harder stuff around mental health and all that, yeah. you know, something that comes up in pretty much every season, sometimes more often than not, is suicidal thoughts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know that you probably have your own ideas and stuff that you, you can talk about. So how do we overcome like suicidal depression? Because it's more common than most people think, because if people think that if you mention suicide, it's going to create suicidal thoughts. In fact, it's the reverse effect. Yes. So a huge thing that feeds depression and suicidal thinking is the shame around it. Right. The fact that we feel like we have to hide it, we have to make ourselves invisible, we have to isolate. So there's, you know, some of that root in my childhood, like I alluded to earlier, of just that feeling of these negative emotions are unacceptable to the people around me. So that kind of creates an echo in myself of they're unacceptable to me. And then I'm against myself. And I think that rooting out the problem means killing myself because I think that I'm inextricably connected to these negative emotions that I'm not allowed to have that are bad. 
And so I'm the problem. So how do you eliminate the problem? Voila, right. there you are. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, it's a tough one because when I'm sitting here with you right now and I'm having a good day, I'm feeling good. It's easy for me to say, yeah, that's not actually me. That's just something that happens to me that I move through. It's a lot different when you're in it and you're right. feeling it and it feels tremendously real. And when I say, you know, I've overcome suicidal depression, to me, that means I'm alive. It does not mean I never have a suicidal thought. I never get depressed. That is a totally like inaccurate characterization because these pathways for me are super well-worn. Like something triggers me to feel unworthy. Boom. I'm right there. I want to die having that thought. And even in every time I have that moment, it's a practice of not identifying with it. Right. Not believing that it's permanent and knowing that I can move through this and remembering that I have the tools. And every single time it happens, I kind of sharpen my toolkit, no matter how shitty it feels right. while it's happening. So it's it's also sharpening that same mindfulness skill of like, ooh, I recognize I feel really shitty right now. Let me go back to the basics. Let me feed myself something good. Let me just comfort myself, drink some water, watch a TV show, just get away from it, not kind of scratch at it and conclude that I'm the biggest piece of shit that's ever walked the face of the earth. Try to avoid that if you can. Or if not, you know, again, like really holding yourself with gentleness and like, yeah, this is where I am right now and it's okay. Well, you talked about it earlier about, and I think about it as a Buddhist process of observing it and not letting it take over. Yes. Most people know I'm, uh, I practice Buddhist principles, so I am very much into that. The other thing that I want to mention is the neurological concept that you talked, which is very important. I tell people like, if you have a super highway that goes from your midbrain to your, you know, your upper brain that says, you know, suicidal thought, how about just killing yourself? You need to learn how to put dents in that super highway. You got to learn how to destroy some lanes. You got to learn how to get on the exits and the off ramps of some sort and really working on that. And you talked about a lot of different techniques. I always recommend that even if it's a passive suicidal thought, just learn to observe it. It's okay to have a thought, you know, maybe I shouldn't be here. And I, I have that more than I care to share here on my podcast. How would you recommend we deal with some of other ways to deal with some passive suicidal thoughts? Maybe we're feeling good, but then suddenly the thought pops out. I'm like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be here. Do you have any suggestions for people? Oh yeah. So the biggest thing for me or the biggest like area of tools in my toolkit that's been helpful for me is creativity, self-expression, making something. Because I'm sure you've heard this, the kind of conceptualization of depression as anger turned inward. Right. And a lot of us people who are depressed have someone in our lives that was angry at us and that we kind of stomached that and swallowed that, took in their criticism and let it kind of fester inside of us. And again, that that impulse of I hate you for yelling at me gets turned into I hate me for being myself and triggering that person's anger. And that's sort of this flipped script. And that's where that, in in my experience, that's where I think that that impulse to harm ourselves or kill ourselves comes in. It's like, well, I can't change this outside person who's so angry or so upset with me. I can change myself. They want me to not be there or they're so their amount of upset with me is so intense. The only thing I can do to make the world a better place, right. save them from their selves is to remove myself. And so that internalizing process is so harmful and self-expression is to me the best antidote, whether it's talking, whether it's journaling, whether it's dancing. I've done a lot of like dancing practice because the other thing about self-expression that's so powerful is the more that it can you can use your whole body as a way of expressing and externalizing what's stored 
literally in your body. Like when I talk about you stomach someone else's anger, myself and a lot of my clients really describe that feeling of nervousness or anxiety or low self-worth as coming from their stomach. It feels like that's where it's centered. So if you can move your body, if you can yell and scream, in my case, you can sing, you're actually reversing that action that was done to you. And it's really potent. I yeah, I hear the singing thing. I, I I don't think that with this gravelly voice that I have, I'm quite the singer yet, but I like the whole talking. I like the whole journaling. You know, I tell people get a coloring book, get a sheets to draw, get something like that. And really helps the dancing part when you're self-conscious and I'm going to throw maybe a curveball here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Not trying to. because <laughs> Not <the> ready. <laughs> the first thing that came to mind is that if you're someone who has body image issues, you're already mm -hmm. depressed because of it. Maybe you get suicidal thoughts. How do we encourage someone to like, I personally don't care if I dance and people like, look, I got two, I got a teenage daughter and you know, I'm about to be a teen. So <laughs> believe me, they're already embarrassed about me. So I've learned to like, not give a crap and that giving a fuck about what other people think is very important in my opinion. But how do you encourage people to dance? Because some people really struggle and that's not like people always, the misconception is, oh, it's because you're big. No, sometimes it's because you feel like you're awkward because you're too small or you don't have whatever. And I've heard it in every different ways. How do we encourage people to dance more? Yeah. Okay. So I think for someone who is struggling with self-consciousness about their body, which has been me, I back when I was saying that, you know, when I was like a teenager and starting to have depression, I would look at myself in the mirror and literally think I was the ugliest human being on the planet. Like I was absolutely convinced that there was not a specimen more disgusting than me. And I was just a normal, awkward teenager, you know? Uh, how many teenage girls go through that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially with women. Oh my God. It's oh, yes. just heartbreaking. But yeah. So I think that for that state, you, you don't want to start with something where you're super visible, maybe even to yourself, maybe even cover your mirrors. Just find music that you can't help but like move to in some way, whether it's just tapping your foot, nodding your head, just something that that starts to make you move and try to breathe through even the discomfort and self-consciousness that might come from just even knowing you're trying something to help yourself. Like, or if you have a self-consciousness about your stomach and you start to like move your torso around, that might bring up the awareness of, ooh, I don't like how my stomach is and feels right now. So maybe you close your eyes or maybe you start moving a part of your body that you don't have as complicated feelings about. But yeah, I think picking a playlist specifically that works for you is a huge start. And then just letting it be continually shifting your focus to about how it feels rather than how it looks. One of the most healing practices of all time, which this is I'm sort of describing here, is ecstatic dance, which is essentially the practice of it's a moving dancing meditation that's all about how does it feel in your body and expressing things with your body versus how it looks or if you're on rhythm or it's it's not at all about you know choreography or looking cool it's all about moving your body as a therapy for your body and that you know you could kind of graduate from covering the mirrors and dancing in your living room to going to an ecstatic dance event. But when I first started doing that, I was tremendously self-conscious dancing in front of other people. But I found this great, this great meeting. It was just a bunch of old hippies. And I was like, okay, I think I can, I think I can like <laughs> interact with this in my own way. And even just showing up, even if you don't feel comfortable enough dancing yet, showing up, observe, watch other people, see what they do, or Kind of focus on, okay, let me start with my hand. What are just all the different configurations of ways I can spread my fingers out and create tension, create looseness? And what if the air was a different texture? And just playing these little games with yourself to kind of take the focus off 
how do I look dancing? <laughs> well, you know, all I can think of is, you know, dance therapy and shout out to my colleague, Courtney Romanowski, who does it in my office. She's amazing. And yeah, I think that that's the stuff that the, expo- the exposure was hard. I, I mean, for me, I, I'm not quite there yet, I'll be honest. But last year, I finally went to a yoga studio, which I'd never done before. And, you know, I felt awkward. I felt shy. I felt like people were going to judge me and stuff like that. It was, this, it was the least judgmental people I've ever met in my life. They were like so happy to have me there and come back. So, I, you know, you need to get over it sometimes. And maybe you do start at home and kind of like bring it. I talk about yoga We'll talk about dance maybe in a few weeks. Uh, obviously, I'll, I'll 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 tell I'll let you know, but uh, I'm not quite there yet. I will work <laughs> on. Yoga is a great inter- intro to dance. I I've been doing yoga for a long time. Feel super grateful that that's been a part of my kind of like athletic training. But going into a dance situation, knowing that I can make certain postures with my body was a great kind of way to grease the wheels into doing it to music. And I, anyone who asked me about yoga, I said, you know, if you know downward dog and child's pose, you're probably 50% there. You're good. <laughs> yep. Yep. Those so, are critical. <laughs> I know. Like, so that's why like one of my clients who recently went to yoga, so you're, like, you're right. That's like 50% of it. I said, yeah, you're not going to do the crow's pose right away. And that's fine. It's okay. You, you get to it eventually. Just be okay. And that's certainly something we, we talk about with my clients. I talk about just about everything, as you can tell. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So let's shift gears a little bit here and talk about how do you figure out what you want? Because you talked about your journey and I can't tell you how much I am. Thank you for sharing number one. Number two, such a great journey. I'm so happy that you found yourself again. But how do we encourage people to go there? Yeah. So some of the best decisions I've ever made for myself that have led to more great decisions and more opportunities and more things that I like and that I want come from listening to the tiniest, smallest little whispers that sometimes you don't even understand or can't even really translate or justify with words. It's just a really small feeling or impression. Like when I moved to Los Angeles, for example, I just... I got a sense that it would be a place where I might be happy based on some friends who had moved from New York to LA and kind of what they said about the experience, seeing LA depicted on TV. It can be the silliest thing, but it's like if it for some reason just kind of resonates to you or maybe maybe you don't even know if it resonates yet, but you right. just kind of think about it. It kind of sticks in your brain something in you is telling you like, look more closely at this. And the more that you do, this kind of mirrors the transition for me between from therapy to coaching is like the more that you can heal the pain and the intensity of the negative voices and thoughts, the more space you have to really just listen to yourself. Like the more you can tolerate quiet and the more that you can hear the subtler signals of what your body is telling you. And then that's when you start to transition into following the positive things and building on that instead of just working with healing the negative stuff. Then it becomes all about what can you discover? What can you attract? What can you feel in your body that really like lights you up? So that's kind of like moves you all the way across the spectrum from the worst of the worst to like, I am absolutely shining and living my purpose because I'm patient and I'm listening to myself. And it's moving yourself from the depression. And I think that that's Mm -hmm. what you're talking about. You know, you talked about rule of thumb. I'm sure you've heard this too. Depression is thinking too much about the past and anxiety Mm -hmm. is worried about the future. And I know this is not a steadfast rule, but it's a good rule of thumb. And being able to figure out what you want by going through all that is very important. Um, Obviously, we talked about different ways to do so. Obviously, coaching is one of them. How do you do that through your coaching practice? Yeah, so a lot of different ways. As I said before, coming from my art therapy background, I was exposed to a really wide toolkit of how can you work with people? What different kinds of tasks can you give them? Seeing how they approach certain projects 
And then that also just broke it open even further of like, how can I get people to use their bodies to convey how they're feeling? And okay, they're feeling depressed. What does that look like in their body? And they curl up into fetal position. Okay, how do you want to feel? And they spread out and they open their arms wide. And it's like, right. okay, so what is it? What are the concrete steps it takes to go from needing to curl up to feel safe to feeling expressive and open and naturally letting yourself just kind of move the way that you want to. And, and then you kind of reverse engineer the metaphor. I do a lot of guided meditation and visualization with clients. I find that to be one of the most profound practices because, you know, you start by relaxing people and grounding them and getting them to focus on their breath. And then that kind of takes care of the like, I'm too anxious to even think straight stuff. So you get them really to be able to listen to their bodies. And then it's like, what is your body saying to you? Okay, right. I feel a nervousness in my stomach. Okay, let's take a look at that. What color would you say it is? That's where the mindfulness skill comes in. It's it's starting to be aware of something, noticing it, describing it. I would I compare it to like you're a scientist and you're in there and you're trying to just convey to someone who's never seen a nervous stomach, what is that like? Or you feel tension in your jaw. Okay. Like paint that picture for me. And things always come to light in the way that people describe, the way that they feel, the the messages and signals that they get. It's like once we clear that like looming cloud of everything feels anxious or everything feels depressed – their inner voice can talk to them through their subconscious, through their body, through whatever. And then that you have your pilot in you. Everybody does. Everybody has their pilot inside of them. But it's like, how do you make the conditions right for them to come out, feel safe, to communicate and start to open up that dialogue so that then you can ask questions to them anytime you want. Right. How does this feel? How does that feel? What should I do with here? What should I do there? Yeah. It's kind of normalizing what we're feeling. And I think that that's very tough. The other normalizing thing that I want to ask you is mm -hmm. that I, I get I, at this point, I'm not annoyed, but disturbed by how people make meditation sound like, you know, you got to be on the seat cushion and be there for five hours. And then suddenly you're going to be enlightened for the rest of your life. Do you get that too or not? And how do you kind of break that wall down for people? Yeah. I think that I used to approach meditation with that sort of perfectionistic, totally unrealistic attitude of like, yeah, I'm going to sit here and I'm just going to be calm and still and observe my thoughts and I'm going to be like a rock. And it, no, <laughs> <laughs> like the, the amount of times when I sit for meditation and I have to stop myself from just popping up and doing something on my to-do list or chasing down whatever thought that comes up. I mean, it's just infinite. You, you just do it infinitely. Like, the practice is continually letting go of your attachment to all the ways that your mind wants to race and wants to tell you this or that or the other and take you back to the past or ahead to the future. It's just that continual like hurting it back in, hurting it back in, hurting it back in. And a lot of times that doesn't feel peaceful. It feels really uncomfortable. And what I encounter a lot is people that are like, yeah, meditation just doesn't work for me. It's too hard. I can't sit still. I can't this. I can't that. So maybe sitting on a cushion for 20 minutes in silence isn't your starting meditation. Right. Yoga could be your starting meditation. Taking a walk and just kind of noticing what's happening in your five senses. That can be a meditation. Like broadening that definition out so that you can find your your gateway drug of meditation. <laughs> right. That's, that's a good drug to have, by the way, too. Yeah. That's a, it's I, trippy, man. <laughs> it is trippy. Sometimes you're like, Oh my God, I saw colors. I always use this and I don't know what, you know, I I've talked to clients and I say, okay, let's do a, a, a quick meditation exercise. They're like, okay, what is it? Okay. So close your eyes. If you're, you're comfortable, it's okay. If you don't take a deep breath, hold it. And let it go. There you go. You've done your first meditation. How did I feel? And most people are like, oh, that's that simple. I'm like, yeah, it's not. And that's not as complicated as most people make it. And then you get to five minutes. And if you get to, and if you're lucky, you get to be eight hours and good for you because I am not even close to that. No. But 
just trying to break down the whole idea. I like your idea of also walking and being mindful of your five senses. I, I love that work on mindfulness and just being okay. I go back to Jay Sheedy too, who wrote the book, Think Like a Monk. Mm-hmm. And he says, it's not about closing your mind completely. It's observing the thoughts that come into your mind. It's not, if you, if you can empty your mind, congratulations, that's great. However, I don't know many people who do that, including monks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's sort of like the misinterpretation of like overcoming suicidal depression. It doesn't mean I'm never depressed. I never have suicidal thoughts. Being mindful doesn't mean I just snap my fingers and my mind's clear. It's living through the way we are naturally and being spacious around it. Right. And learning to be able to be in the moment, which is, you know, one of the other ways I tell people to be mindful, me worrying about getting my car windshield repaired. This is not going to help me in my conversation with Morgan right now. (laughs) It's just not. So might as well just contact the moment versus thinking about 14 things. And that's what I think is another mindfulness exercise that people find helpful. Yeah. Contact the moment. I love that expression. It's great. And that's, that's all you can do. I can't be with anyone else, but Morgan right now. And that's the most important thing in my life. So that's how I perceive it. Fighting your way through therapy against Steve Beeson. I'm talking to Morgan Beard. Morgan, I want to switch gears again. And I'd love to hear more about, I don't know what you want to start off with. I know that you talk about rock your stress, Mm -hmm. but I really want to go into your music because I think that to me, you you know, I have no voice. I don't know how to play instruments, but music is probably the most important thing in my life other than, you know, my kids probably. I love listening to music. It's just the greatest tool in the world, in my opinion. And I was thinking about, I I can't pronounce his name. We'll call him Baz, who does wear sunscreen. And talking about how if you got to live on the East Coast, uh, leave before it makes you too hard. And if you go to the West Coast, leave before it makes you too soft. (laughs) So whenever you tell me your story, it's always what comes to mind. But whatever you want to start off with, because maybe if we're going to maybe finish off on Rock Your Stress, and then I'd love to hear more about your music. Yeah. Well, the first thing I have to say is I'm not going to let you get away with saying you have no voice because here you are talking to me using your voice. (laughs) Okay. Touche, (laughs) touche. Yeah. I'm not doing my job there. If I miss that, I'll let that go by. You're such a coach. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You can't, can't extract it. But yeah, like I, for, for me, the process of finding my voice was just shifting that limiting belief that I wasn't allowed to share it or that I was too much. I was too loud. I was too bossy. I was too all these different criticisms that I fielded. And so for me, going from coaching other people to really acting on my own impulses, obviously I still coach. I love it, but I'm also welcoming in this other creative avenue alongside it. it it's been a lot about just starting at where my edge is and building slowly outwards. So I wasn't starting with no voice because I love to sing so much. I would sing in the shower, like anywhere in the car, anywhere where I was private, no one could hear me. I was singing. So I was kind of stretching my voice out in that way. For me, the, the edge was doing it in front of someone else. Like I had to overcome so much guilt and yeah. shame and like self-loathing in order to even open my mouth in that way in front of someone else. I mean, you know, someone might look at you and be like, oh, I could never be on a podcast. You know, it's just about where are you starting and and where are you kind of shifting those those beliefs? And so my music is both a very personal transformation process that I'm going through purely because I want to keep pushing the boundaries of my comfort zone and kind of do what I think I I came here to do, what my body, my spirit's telling me to do. But I also want to really open up my world to people and kind of express in a musical, catchy way, using pop music as a vehicle to get people to understand some of the thought processes, some of the emotions that have gone into my personal transformation. And not only using the actual sounds to get people to move their bodies, but also my music is very lyric driven and it's it's very much about what can I tell myself? 
how can I talk to myself? And as a coach, it's like you try to get people to internalize what you're saying to them when they have a tough moment. And, you know, you want them to to take you in so that they can feel empowered on their own and say the right things, do the right things, you know, build themselves up and see their strengths instead of their weaknesses. So the music is about like just trying to get stuck in people's heads, positive shit. (laughs) Right. And you know what I, what I want to say, and I can't let this one go because I'm a feminist and I have no problem saying that you're too loud. You're too this, you're too that. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the bullshit that women have to put through? I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. I had to say that because that's, I love it, but just had to say that because that's what they say to women. Like, yeah, I'm not threatened by any of that. Anyway, just want to mention that. No, thank Uh, you. That's meaningful. I appreciate it. you, You don't need to be anybody's box. You just be yourself. You know, I talk about, you talked about your music and going past that edge. Mm-hmm. I met Alanis Morissette a long time ago cool. when she was in Montreal, still doing dance music. If you ever want to hear that's there's a, when I met her, I, I can share the story offline. I'm not going to share it here. Alanis music, especially Jaggy Little Pill, when I was growing up was kind of like the most meaningful music. I really love her lyrics. There's a lot of French artists that I really love, uh, including Isabelle Boulay and other stuff that lyrically driven. Who are your influences in your music? That's a great question. So I, I grew up with a very wide variety of tastes. My dad had a big CD and record collection. And the people that I was obsessed with were Whitney Houston, Madonna, Elton John, Ray Charles. Good voices, all of them. Good voices, very soulful. Christina Aguilera. I was also a 90s child. I was born in 1990. So like the 90s pop icons were also huge for me. And anyone who had kind of like a a soulful expression, something like deep and connected either in what they were saying or how their voice worked or, you know, kind of just the, the cadence of the music behind them. Like there's something like pushing outward, something sort of transformative about it. I talked actually on another podcast about Madonna and I mean, she, what a feminist icon she was. I mean, she was really pushing the boundaries of, you know, at her time about, of, of free female sexual expression. I mean, people were just like shocked by what she was doing and now everything looks like porn. So (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I remember staying up for the videos in the the nineties when she was releasing justify my love and stuff like that. So I do remember that too, but go ahead. I'm sorry. But no, 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 no. I love that. It's a great personal connection, but yeah. So just like people who were really like sharing pieces of themselves, that was a huge influence on me. And I've always been someone who's tried really hard to share myself as openly and vulnerably and honestly as possible. And so I think it's, it's, it's honestly hard to describe. This is the one question where you've kind of stumped me because I always kind of knew I get it. All right. (laughs) I always kind of struggle to talk about like artists that inspire me because it, it is like what I was talking about earlier about sometimes you just know you like something you can't necessarily put your finger on why it moves you, but it does. And there are just so many tremendous artists that have moved me through all the different channels of expression. And I I go back to, again, my roots in Montreal. The the one regret I have is not liking Leonard Cohen sooner in my life. Because you listen to his lyrics nowadays, I'm like, Jesus Christ, why? how did I miss that guy? And unfortunately, mm. he's not of this world anymore. Is there like a voice that particularly, you talked about Madonna, but is there like one person, one voice, one like Christina's, book, Christina's lyrics, you get past the pop music. There's a lot of like really meaningful songs that she's written. Mm-hmm. Anybody in particular that really kind of like you say, oh my God, I, this is the person I could, I wish I could emulate. Mm. Yeah, I, I could name so many. I mean, Adele, I her most recent album, I'm I'm not going to say I'm that familiar with it, so I I don't want to mislead anyone, but like her like 21 that album, I mean, every single song just 
pouring her heart and soul into it. It's like the, and it comes from a broken heart, you know, that, that right. all this amazing shit gets put down because you're just so compelled to create because you have to self-express. That's where I feel like the music just hits, you know, like, and her voice is so soulful and her lyrics are so like rich and raw and connected and you can just feel it. The immediacy is there. Celine Dion is another one who I, another diva who I just absolutely idolized and loved. And these women like Celine Dion and, and I think, I think Adele will get there, but it's a little too soon to tell who have just like transcended time and decade after decade after decade are still relevant and Madonna still reinventing herself. I mean, the, the evolution of these artists too is absolutely tremendous and knowing what it takes to just put one work out into the world. I, you know, I don't know how you do it for decades and decades and decades. I can only hope to continue to have enough fire and things to say and, and desire to self-express that I continue to push that envelope. You know, I feel like I'm plugging Quebec all left and right with Celine Neon here. Yeah. You know, I've, I've watched Celine Neon's career since 1984 uh, and she first really came out and she sang for uh, Pope John Paul II at the Olympic Stadium in Montreal. And she really evolved from there. And her music has been very, like, again, listening to the lyrics of her songs are really, really good. I can't tell you that I felt that way when I was in Quebec necessarily, but I did go see her in concert and she was pretty good. I really liked her energy. She has a lot of energy and she's kind of different when she speaks in French and it's kind of like very familiar. And mm. I don't know if that helps with music, but for me, sometimes it's like that fami familiarity really helps me connect with an artist. Yeah. yeah. So listening to like, uh, I, I, go, I go old school. This is even before me in some ways. Like James James Taylor has great lyrics, great songs mm -hmm. that I really, really like. So I, James Taylor is another and local from Massachusetts. So good guy. So I know this is only coming out on April 20th. So your first single will be out already. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about it? Yes, definitely. So I guess I haven't actually explained the whole uh, thrust of the project, but. Oh, please do. Yeah. So this is my debut visual EP. So it's also going to be told through music videos in addition to the songs. It's called Elemental and it uses the four elements, fire, water, earth, and air to tell a story of personal transformation. And so fire is the beginning. Fire is like we're in the flames. Things are not going well. <laughs> we're in the midst of a toxic relationship that is just like that push pull. Like I'm really drawn in, but it's kind of dangerous. It's too much. I'm not really getting what I need out of it. It's just kind of, it's that, that feeling of like chemical dependency that you can feel with another person on just chemistry, but there's not the you're not actually meeting emotionally. They're not giving you what you need or they abandon you. So fire tells that story of just being in the heat of that moment and how it can be all consuming and you lose yourself in it. And then water, which will also be out. That one is about letting yourself cry, letting yourself grieve, being in sadness after something dissolves that you were really invested in. Right. And discovering that you can survive your own emotions. On the 22nd, the third song, Earth, will come out. And that is about recognizing your own internal strength and that you don't need, you can break away from old patterns and you, you discover through water, through letting yourself confront your own emotions and being with yourself at that deep, intimate level that you are strong as hell. And you don't need any of that other stuff. And Air is the last song. And that one is really just about the liberation of realizing like you, you have yourself and that's all you need. And that one, that one's my baby. We just shot that one a couple of weeks ago. And I, uh, I can't wait to share the whole project because it's, it flows together. I've connected all the songs with like natural sound interludes. So it kind of emulates this cycle of nature and the cycle of evolution that we go through as we move through our emotions. And that's really kind of the, the, the whole thrust of the project. 
And air would be out when, do you know? So truthfully, I'm kind of still making that part up as I go along. The whole EP will be No out. one knows. No one listens. No one knows. <laughs> <laughs> May 27th All right. is the whole EP. And I haven't really decided yet if I'm going to release, like, I'm going to release probably the song, but I might hold the video back for the whole EP so that it's like something new rather than just like, okay, now it's all out again in a different like format with a different cover. But yeah, listening to it all back to back to back to back, it's, it's crazy. It's taken me like three years to make 15 minutes of music, but it's, it's a really cool. Yeah. It's the process. It's the process. It's, it has a really cool flow and each song is really different. There's the through line of kind of like my voice and the structure, the pop structure, but each song really tries to capture the element that it's about and using the qualities and the sounds of what is that, what is the tone and what is the nature of that element? So they're all inherently quite different. Well, I'm going to make sure to link all that to my show notes. And as you grow and become even more pro proficient at your music, I, uh, I sure hope that you don't forget about us. And I would love to have you back on because I think that there's about 20 other questions that I had <laughs> that I skipped. And yeah. I could talk about music for hours, but I know this is finding your way through therapy, not talk about music. <laughs> so I want to think, thank you because I the honesty everything came through so amazingly well. And it's always great to have a guest like you who's just authentic and real. And I really appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, you set the stage for that being yourself as well, but I, that that's really meaningful to me. Thank you so much. Well, I think they will have to have you back sooner rather than later. Amazing. I would love that. Thank you. Well, that concludes episode 45 of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. Thank you so much, Morgan Beard. I hope that you guys get to go to listen to the first three songs. And I know the fourth song is coming out very soon. And get her EP ASAP. And also, if you want to join her coaching uh, practice, I will put that in the show notes. Episode 46 will be with Jen Nakai, someone I've known for a while. She remembers me from helping her when we worked together at the same agency. And we're going to talk about COVID and the impact it has. It's actually going to be a two-episode segment. I can't wait to do that with Jen. I've known Jen for a while. I know our conversation is going to be probably electric, so I hope you join us for that. Please like, subscribe, or follow this podcast on your favorite platform. A glowing review is always helpful. And as a reminder, this podcast is for information, educational, and entertainment purposes. If you are struggling with a mental health or substance abuse issue, please reach out to a professional counselor or therapist for consultation.